The following program is sponsored by Friends of Life Outreach International. Next, war room actor T.C. Stallings grew up surrounded by gangs, violence, and drugs. And it's just every ingredient that today people would say, you know, it's gonna be really hard for you to be anything. I mean, I didn't even know that that's the environment that I was in. When you're young, you just, it seemed like it's the norm. All the kids are like that. And so I didn't even know it was dangerous until, until things started to happen within my life that could pretty much end it for you. Well, you know we're going to say it's a joy to have you join life today because it is. I'm James, and this is Betty. Uh, I saw this guy, uh, T.C. Stalins, in a tremendous movie that just blessed us. Uh, matter of fact, we were sitting pretty close to Tony Evans and his wife, and uh, Priscilla was one of the stars in the movie War Room. And boy, what a powerful movie, and what a tremendous need for that that kind of prayer room and answered prayer. And uh, our guest was uh, married in that movie to the part that Priscilla Shower played, T.C. Stalins. He's an athlete, uh, thought he was going to be NFL bound forever. <laughs> But he really came from an um, almost impossible situation. I won't even tell you about it. T.C., this is a book he wrote on Eyes Fixed. and Go ahead and just tell people what you mean, Eyes Fixed, like fixed where? Eyes Fixed on Jesus and his purpose for your life. I mean, that's really the essence of the whole book. And I've been saying that ever since I realized that that's what's kept me on track. It's not a whole bunch of good things about me and how strong I am or anything like that, because you'll see from the book, I have so many opportunities to get bumped off track. But if you keep your eyes focused on, on Christ and what he wants, that's the way to kind of just, where are you going, Lord? And I don't care where it is. I just want to make sure you're leading. And so if we can get that down, you know, we'll be all right. This comes from Hebrews 12:2. It's one of my favorite scriptures, so... You know, you and I both had a rough start. I didn't have a father. My mother was raped. I grew up in total poverty. Um, just an impossible situation. And you basically had the same situation. Tell us a little bit about your childhood and what, what you actually faced and went through. Yeah, Cleveland, Ohio. And um, so I was born and, and even that, you know, didn't happen. I, I mean, we were talking a little bit in the, in the back about your possibly being aborted, I pretty much faced the same thing. And, um, you know, my mother had, I was the youngest of six. And so by the time I'm coming along, um, at least I could say I got the best version of my mother because she was in her thirties and she had kind of started to come to Christ at that point. But my mother had already faced an, an abortion situation before and had done it. So she was already comfortable with it. And then now I'm a sixth unplanned child. And, um, you know, my father completely out of the picture and uh, she was considering doing it again, but something in her this particular time w helped her to not be comfortable with it. And I believe that the church had a lot to do with that. And so, you know, I'm born into a situation where, again, we were didn't have a whole lot of money. The neighborhood was very, very rough and all the crime and all the drugs and all that stuff. And it's just every ingredient that today people would say, you know, it's gonna be really hard for you to be anything and you'll be lucky to even be alive. And I mean, I didn't even know that that's the environment that I was in. When you're young, you just, it seemed like it's the norm. All the kids are like that. And so I didn't even know it was dangerous until, until things started to happen within my life that could pretty much end it for you. And then you start kind of wanting to desire to get out of that situation. And that's what kind of my dreams and desires start to come from to get out and hopefully one day make a life better for my mother and my family and my siblings. So what'd you do to get out? Well, I picked up a little ball, started running around with it. And uh, <laughs> that was just, I'm watching TV and you just start seeing commercials and things like, hey, you know, you could go to college for free if, if you could play this game well, you can go to NFL. And I was seeing guys buying their mom's houses and all that. And I would just look around and I, you know, watch my mother come home, you know, tired and everything. And I'm just like, you know what? 
that, that, that's my goal, and that's what's going to get me out of here. And I knew no one could afford to get me to college or anything like that. Nobody in my family had ever been. It's not something we ever talked about, but I was seeing it on commercials all the time, and, and I'm just like, you know what, that's, that's going to be me. And I'll never forget Cleveland Municipal Stadium is what it used to be called. It's called First Energy Stadium now. My stepfather, who came into my life when I was about like nine or so, he worked downtown. We go to pick him up. And I, a game was going on. So you could just hear it, <laughs> or whatever. And I knew I would never get inside there because we couldn't afford it. But I said, that's OK, because I'm going to be, the first time I'll be in that state, I'm going to be playing in there. <laughs> I was about 12 years old or so. so like, and my dream started then. And uh, so yeah, I started playing ball. And, 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 and it did deliver on all those things, college and eventually some pro football. OK, so what got you out of that and what got you in a new direction? Explain what in the world went on in your life, take you away from that. Because you, you, you look at him and tell him he's like an athlete. Yeah. Uh, you know, yeah. Somebody would pick him if they're picking teams, you know, somebody would probably say, I'll take your tits on him. Yeah. <laughs> okay, but what, what took you in a, in a different direction? Yeah, well, I'm, I'm, I'm playing, and uh, the only problem that, I, I, that football had for me, football gave me so many things, but the thing is I would, I almost did like you see in scripture where you, you credit the thing instead of the creator of it. And I kind of started to worship the sport. You know, it was just like, I, you know, all my friends, all my opportunities, everything come from football. And so the Lord used football just long enough to where he can get me to the next thing. Um, because a lot of great things happened throughout my career. But in 2008, when I was, I had a great season over in Europe. I was like, I'm bring all that back and I'm going to go to NFL. It's going to be great. But I went, went to a movie. I went to see Fireproof. Oh, yeah. And I remember my friends telling me, like, hey, we're going to go see this movie. Uh, it's about, like, fixing your marriages or something <laughs> like that. I'm like, man, I've been married seven years. I got it all figured out. Like, oh, you just ask my wife. I'm the best. Hu-. So you go in there thinking you were great. You, the end of the movie, you the worst husband ever. It just makes you feel like, oh, you got so much to work on. But I just saw the power from that film, and I remember just my heart started to really just beat for acting, and that came out of nowhere. You know, acting had just been something I would play around with, but now I feel like, wow, I think I want to do this. And I turned to my wife and I said, who made this movie? And she said, the Kendrick Brothers. And I said, well, let's just start praying about working with them, because they do the type of films that I think I can do. And a year and a half later, I sure enough got an audition with the Kendrick Brothers, and I landed my first ever role. So it was a direct answered prayer, which gave me the courage to keep pursuing it. It was Courageous. Courageous. Oh, yeah. I played the gang leader in Courageous. <laughs> and uh, that's a whole other story. I did everything I could to get that audition. And, uh, but they gave me a shot at it. And then uh, from that point, Hollywood saw Courageous. And then they called me and told me, have, have I ever thought about coming out there? At the time, I'm living in Louisville, Kentucky. I kind of thought that that was like a, like, I, I remember telling my wife, like, this must be the devil, man, asking me to come out to Hollywood. I, I do one movie, and all of a sudden, I'm supposed to be some kind of superstar. Like, nah, I'm just going to stay here. And, but we prayed about it, kept praying about, like, what could be the impact? Well, a lot of people that are Christians go out to Hollywood, and they compromise their faith. They leave Jesus behind. And, and there's, there's a stigma that says you have to do that. Well, what if I went out there, and I stayed completely clean, never compromised, and still made it to the top? That would kill that altogether, and I can encourage other up-and-coming actors that you don't have to leave Jesus behind. And sure enough, I went out there, and, and that was enough for me to want to get it done. Three years later, I wake up as as the number one actor in the number one movie in America, and when they start interviewing me out there in Hollywood, I could I was being interviewed as an uncompromising actor, and I could brag about how Jesus had led me to do that. And so. Once that happened, I knew what the Lord wanted me to do, and I never looked back, and that's still my mission today, is to just keep showing that you don't have to leave God out of anything. He doesn't need sin to win, and if you can't do it in front of him, it shouldn't be done. Mm-hmm. And uh, so that's, and it, it, you, you lose a lot of opportunities, but you gain so much more in terms of the approval of the Lord, and that's, that's why I do it. Is your, go ahead, you go around. Was your wife already a Christian when you met her? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's so cool, because we both, we both were really growing in our faith in terms of like, I, in college, my college years is where I truly learned that it, it isn't enough just to believe in Jesus. You have to be a follower as well. A lot of believers don't fully transition into followers. You know, they, the rich young ruler, he believed. He didn't transition. The Bible says the demons believe. They never transition. You got to take that belief and transition to a follower. I learned that in college, and so did my wife. So it was like he was preparing her at the same time he was preparing me uh, to meet. And as you'll see in the book, he also taught me to play a little bit of basketball because without that... <laughs> I might have not had a, have a shot. You, you're reading a book that my wife took me on a basketball date, and if I, she told me if I had lost, dates off. Oh. The, the relationship's over. 
I won the game by one point. Y'all don't read about great. that. that but yeah, we both were praying about. Send, we, she would tell me when, when we got together that she was praying that the Lord was sending her someone that was on the same path as her, which is growing in Him. And I was praying the exact same thing. And so we, we met. It was God's will for it to happen. Is she excited about who you are? Oh man, yeah. I, I always liken our relationship to this roller coaster that she never chose to get off, but she would like for that thing to steady out a bit, <laughs> yeah. and, and, and it has. Oh, and so yeah, so we're. We, you told the story here in, in Eyes Fixed. Yeah. And uh, bottom line, if somebody goes through the book, where do you want it to take them? I want them to know that if if you're familiar with the scripture, um, when, when Peter uh, was in the boat and they're crossing and they look out and they think they see a ghost, but it's really Jesus. And then Peter's like, you know, who is that you, Lord? He's like, Jesus, like, yes, it's me. He's like, well, call me out to you. He jumps out of the boat and with faith and eyes locked in on Jesus, he was doing everything that, that Jesus wanted him to do, walking on the water and everything. Then the storms come, he takes his eyes off Jesus and he starts to like sink and everything is getting messed up. And then Jesus saves him and says, well, why did you lose your faith? And it's obvious why he lost his faith, because he took his eyes off Jesus. As long as he kept his eyes on Jesus, he was doing everything he needed to do. Even they didn't say what no problems were gonna be around, because there were problems, there was the storms and the winds. But when he took his eyes off Jesus, everything started to fall apart. And that is the essence of my life. I believe for sure that's the essence of everybody's life in this world. If Jesus, he, he, he made you for a purpose, on purpose to do something, called you to do it, to live this life from start to finish. Keep your eyes fixed on him. You can get through the pain and the troubles. And notice I didn't say everything's peachy. It's like stuff's <laughs> going to happen. Keep your eyes fixed on him, you're okay. You take your eyes off him, that's where Satan can get all in there and mess everything up. So I hope people can see that it's coming from a person, a real person who's been through things. I wasn't handing anything, but there's nothing special about me. I never was just so strong that I could resist sin and temptation and all of that. The only thing I got right is keeping my eyes locked in on Jesus. And, and I'm glad that my, my mother led me down that direction. And you'll see throughout the book that he kept depositing people in my life that helped me to stay focused on Jesus and know what that meant. Mm -hmm. And now it's locked into the point where I don't know no other way. I get really scared and freaked out and weird if I'm not connected to the Lord through Bible study and prayer. And then I, that's the way I keep my eyes on him. And I feel like if I had one message, if, I, if, if, if when someone's done talking to me or reading this book, they're just like, gosh, I don't want to take my eyes off Jesus. Man, I know I made a disciple. And that's somebody I'm going to see in heaven. And that's what living this life is all about. So that's, that's why I wrote it. How did you end up in Texas? Oh, that's an interesting story. The COVID thing hits. Um, I lose my mom at that time. Uh, the career sh slowed down. It was like everything that you're involved in, it just came to a screeching halt. And I think everybody in the world can relate to that. It's just everything stopped. So at this point, it really takes you to a deeper place in thinking. And I'm just saying like, all right, I just want to hear the Lord in this situation because this is weird to everybody. Me, my wife, my two children. Lord, what do you want me to do right now within this? Even in this, I know you still have a purpose. We're locked in this house. But what do you want us to do? Do I still need to be in Southern California? Do I? And I start, I start questioning everything. Because I just wanted to, everybody was just going so crazy and doing all kinds of different things. I'm like, there is a God thing here. There's a God idea. What is that? And then all, all signs started to point to this state. Whether it was getting closer to other friends, there was a, a TV show that I'm, I'm on now that's filmed here. It's called Vindication. It shoots here. They offered me a role and I took it. And, it was supposed to be a one-time thing, but if you move here, it's a recurring. So I'm like, hmm, that's interesting. <laughs> and so it's just, we prayed, we said, Lord, close any door that you don't want open um, and just open the ones that you do want. Just shut everything else off and everything opened up here for Texas. And so we were nervous about it, but we boldly came. And now I, it was just the best thing <laughs> that we have ever done so far. How would our viewers pray for you? If you say pray for me a special way, me and my wife, how would you want them to pray for you? Well, for me, you know, I, I'm in the entertainment business. I've seen so much. And I got this thing where I always say, like, if you ever go to a restaurant and you complain about what's on the menu, you can either keep eating that and complaining, keep complaining, or you can go and become a chef. And I, that's the way I feel like with Hollywood, it's just like, or just, I shouldn't even say Hollywood, just in the movie entertainment, the entertainment, whatever, it's one of Satan's strongest weapons, all the stuff that he pumped. And I've always complained about that. I've fought against that. I wanna be a chef. I wanna, I wanna cook and put entertainment out that I know is God honoring. It just takes resources to do that. It takes a lot of connections to do that. And those are the type of things that deter 
people like from doing it. But I don't feel like the Lord wants me to, to quit. I feel like he wants me to just prepare. So I've written scripts. I've gotten actors together and I want to pray for the ability to make my own films and help other uncompromising actors like myself make it because we're the ones where it's really hard for us to get stuff. If you're going to just say anything, do anything, do nudity, do <laughs> pornography, do whatever, oh, there's plenty of work for you. But if you want to do it with a God first mentality, it's really hard to get in, but not if there's a cook that's looking <laughs> for people to eat that's that kind right. of food. So that's, I want to, I want to make my own films and employ other people like myself and carry the message of Christ throughout the world. That's that's my goal, so pray for that. It's big, but... And The War God's Room was one of those, one of those kind of parts. Yeah. And a great movie and great producers and then courageous. So if somebody, let's just say people say, we want to help you do what you're doing, how would they... Is there a website or any way they could communicate? We've, we've got you on our heart. Yeah. You know, and, and you got to be careful. People want to come get on your bandwagon right. or whatever you got. That's not, that's not what we're sitting here talking about. We're talking about people <laughs> that want to help him do what God wants him to do and be a servant help yes. to the kingdom purpose of God in his life. Yeah. So how would they get a hold of you? Is sure. Right? Well, my website is www.tcstallings.life, L-I-F-E. And then my manager, which is also my wife, <laughs> if people want to reach out and say, hey, what does TC got going on? How can we help? It's Levette, L-E-V-E-T-T-E, -T -T -E, at tcstallings.life. And... Uh, I, like I, I said, like that title of life. life you know? Yeah, yeah. I, it was everybody's dot com or dot yeah, net, right. and I was like, what could be different? That it, and I'm all about, you know, pursuing your God-given purpose in life above all else. So I was like, that life. Nobody's got that. Let's do that. And uh, yeah, I just, if I could just wake up one day and meet with my manager and my wife and just say, what's the next project that the Lord's prayed about? Hey, we want to make a movie about this, about that, that could bring Him glory, and and be able to say, let's do it. Father, I want you to bless Him beyond measure. I want you to open doors. I want you to lead people who may be watching to really pray for him and his wife, his vision. But also maybe there's some folks watching and say, you know what, we got to get involved or we know we know how we can be a help to him in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, um, T.C., we have for years, you know, I've been preaching, <laughs> really, can you believe I've been preaching 60 years? Wow. I've been awesome. married to this lady 58 years and uh, I'm glad. Uh, do you realize that the greatest joy that we've had is to literally put the arms of Jesus around the overlooked? So often, T.C., it's the least of these. Yeah. It's the people that live out of sight. But when you see them through the eyes of Jesus, you want to get his arms around them. You know, one of the things I've been saying to all of our viewers and to you, you know this, that if the family of God would get healthy and come together in supernatural unity, submitted to his headship, his lordship, we could put his loving arms around the world that he gave his life to redeem. That's what we do when we feed the hungry, give water to the thirsty, set the captives free, put shoes on little feet, do everything we can to express the life and love of God freely. Listen to the lead missionary's son, Esau, and what he's seeing. He, he basically, like his dad, left everything to be a missionary. Peter went to heaven just a couple of years ago. But boy, he left so much life behind. Esau continues. Listen to the heart of God through this wonderful missionary. And you are gonna become the miracle someone longs for, even prays for. Watch. With all the problems facing each and every one of us, it would be very easy to pull back and close our eyes to the plight of children in this world. Children who, through no fault of their own, are suffering because of the lack of food. We're here in an area in northern Mozambique, and we've been going from village to village. We've been speaking to mothers in all of these villages, and there's one common thing that these mothers have been sharing with us, and that is the fact that they have no food. 
Many mothers have told us how they've lost children as a result of just simply not being able to feed their children. The situation here is at crisis level. Children dying simply because there isn't enough food. In Angola, we're seeing from multi years of drought, we've actually just this week, I got a report from our staff in Angola showing that over 200% increase in the number of children being admitted into the malnutrition clinics there. We know that more children coming in and being admitted to malnutrition clinics doesn't just mean a statistic. It means more mothers whose hearts are broken. In South Sudan right now, we're seeing flooding. We've got malnutrition clinics that because of your love, we've been able to rebuild. But there's many that we still need to rebuild. And if we're not able to rebuild those clinics, we're not able to extend the lifeline that those clinics give to the mothers and the children that so desperately need it. Many of those mothers are relying on us, counting on us. Please. It's a crisis situation here, but it's a situation that we can turn around. We can change these conditions because the solution is food. The solution is opening our hearts, bringing a heart of love and a pipeline of food because that literally is a gift of life. Do you realize who it is that provides that porridge mix, that soup mix. It's uh, kind of like a cream of wheat as mm -hmm. far as textured. Uh, it's just amazing. Will you do it? Do you know who provides those bowls? Our viewers, Betty. Right. Said, why don't you give them something to put the porridge, the soup, the food in, rather than bringing a tin can or some plastic bag to get the, the hot soup? Why don't, why don't you do it? That's what you said. Do you realize that you have shown us, as viewers of life today, the heart of God, the mind of God, the will of God, the love of God? Would you right now, please, become the answer to those mother's prayers? Do you realize how many times they must say, God, please help me get food for my baby, my child? You want your prayers answered. How about you be an answer to prayer? That is what our viewers are, Betty. Mm, they really are. They're the answers to many prayers. Please keep this in mind because there's a level at which everyone can participate. For $30, 50 or $100, we can feed three, five, or 10 children for the next months. $1,000, and some of you can do that, we can feed 100. You heard Esau say, we still need to rebuild some more of these malnutrition clinics. That's 24,500. You may say, wow, but God, you've done it. There are people who can do that. Betty, I'm just praying that everybody watching will just say, let me be the answer to some mother's prayer. Let me be the miracle. And I believe they're going to do it. I believe you will, too. As I was watching along with you and I watched those precious little children, they were coming because something was being offered to them, nourishment. I remember just recently, one of our great-grandchildren came over. Her name is Addie. And usually when she's there for a short time, she'll say, Mimi, can I have a snack? And she goes straight for my pantry because she knows where the snacks are. And I'm thinking, these children aren't looking for a snack. They're looking for life. They're looking for nourishment. I want them to know there's a place prepared for them that they can come and get that nourishment. And I know you do too, so please join with us and let's offer that nourishment to them. And I really believe you will. I want you to go get your bank card if you and use it like a check. If you use a check, make it to life. But I want you to dial that number and tell us what you're sending or take that bank card and make the gift today or you can go online and make the gift. We're going to send you these beautiful tumblers, His Love Never Fails and Give Thanks. And by the way, you prove His Love Never Fails. For those of you who will give a gift of... Uh, hundred dollars or more along with the gift that we're giving for any gift Christmas grace 31 meditations and declarations on the greatest gift ever Jesus wow thank you thank you for getting that card thank you for making that call or going online and becoming a miracle a miracle answer to prayer and Betty and I pray in every one of you watching 
will give life to some precious children right now. Across the continent of Africa, children are suffering, facing severe malnutrition and even death. With food reserves gone and many areas experiencing severe famine, we urgently need to replenish supplies to keep feeding the 350,000 children who are counting on us. Call now with your life-saving gift of 30, 50, or $100 to help feed and care for three, five, or 10 children for three full months. Also, please consider an extra gift to help immediately rebuild malnutrition clinics destroyed by record flooding in South Sudan. This urgent need is $392,000 above our normal feeding budget and is critical to help save the lives of those who are suffering most. With your gift of any amount, we'll send you Christmas Grace. This eye-opening new 31-day devotional will give you a fresh perspective on the greatest gift ever given and the life-transforming hope found in Christ's birth. With your gift of $100 or more, request the Love and Thanks Tumblr set. With scriptures reminding us that God's love never fails and to always give thanks, these tumblers will keep drinks hot or cold wherever you go. Finally, with your gift of $1,000 or more to help feed and care for 100 children, be sure to request our inspiring bronze sculpture, Divine Servant. Please call, write, or make your gift online today. Well, let me just say that I really, uh, I just really believe you're gonna help. By the way, if this, this, this is, boy, such a good looking guy. <laughs> <laughs> His wife's just beautiful. They're a beautiful couple. They're dressed up in Jesus. Everybody looks good dressed up in Jesus. If you'd like you to have the book, say, James, we're going we're gonna to help feed those kids. I'd like to read that story. And I, I got somebody I want to share that with. Please do so. And you know if you can uh, communicate with uh, TC and say, we're praying for her, but maybe we know how we can help you do what God, what God put on your heart. TC, thank you so much for being here. Thank you. I'm glad you moved to Texas. You know, it's <laughs> kind of preparation. You know, prom promised land life. Right? <laughs> is that we, what it is? Yeah, we're <laughs> glad you. We've, we've lived up here 50 years in yeah. our area. But we're glad to see you. Thank you all for watching life today. Hey, thanks for sharing life. Thanks for giving life. We sure do love you. being held by the God who can be trusted to rescue his people. Sheila Walsh, tomorrow on Life Today. Life Today is made possible by the supporters of Life Outreach International. Your gift will be used exclusively for the exempt purposes of life. The ministry features specific outreaches as examples of the programs it supports and conducts. Gifts are considered to be without restriction as to use unless explicitly stipulated by the donor. The ministry is a member of the ECFA.